Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about interactions and by interaction I don't mean necessarily correlation but also some sort of causality. So we've seen examples of interaction before, so in this case we saw that the interaction between the airport and the number of delays was crucial to understand the data set. And I'm going to discuss another example. So let's go back to this National Longitudinal Survey of Youth and we discuss this interaction between, sorry, this correlation between kids' score and the question Mount Phoenix High School, okay? But we can also take a look at this data set and, and, and try to plot another information. And in this case, in that data set, we can also see the mom's IQ. So again, if we take a look at how kids' score in the exam is related to mom's IQ, we could see that, okay, this is not perfect, but there is some, there is some clear or evident trend. So the higher the IQ, it looks like the higher the kids' score. So if we take a look at this more quantitatively, we can see that Absolutely, there is some correlation. It's not very large, so it's only 20% of the, the variance of the kids' score is captured by mom's IQ, but this is pretty significant. But to me, it's quite reasonable to think that moms with high, uh, higher IQ has also more chances to finish high school. So I would say that it's not a matter of taking those two separately or even to combine them additively. So there is some sort of causality there. And if you go back to the first video in the series, the introduction to regression, we discussed some assumptions behind linear regression. And one of the most strong ones was additivity. The idea that the effect of one variable is independent of the effect of the other variables. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. So this is what happens without interaction. You can see that y is the, the variable that we want to predict, and we have these two regressors, x1 and x2. And additivity means basically this. So whenever I increase one point in the x1, I'm increasing beta 1 points in the vertical direction. And this is independently of what is happening in x2. And this is why these boxes here are rectangles. Okay, so it's independent. You can see that it doesn't matter at which level in x2 I am. Increasing in this direction is always the same. So basically I'm changing this amount here and this the same amount here. What happens if we introduce interactions? Well, imagine that we have the, the simplest interaction possible, that is x1 times x2. Now we have something which is completely different. So if x2 is equal to 0, basically we're dropping this term and this term, and you can see that we have the same increases as before. So basically this line should be this straight line. And the same for x1 equals 0, so we would be moving our, along this line. But what if instead we assume, for instance, that x1 is equal to x2, so that would be the diagonal in this plane. In that case, this is kind of polynomial regression that we've seen before. So this is a kind of parabola and this is a quadratic regression. And what is interesting is that the, the length of this diagonal, the, the length of the increases of the variable is, uh, is different at, at every step. So there is a synergistic interaction between these two and the largest the two of them, the largest is the increase along this line. So the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So what's the deeper meaning of interaction? And let's go back to this formula. Let's do this mathematical trick in which I'm grouping together terms proportional to x1. And now this looks like a good old linear regression with just one variable, which is x1. But here is the trick. So basically, we have defined a new intercept and a new uh, slope, and these are function of x2. So for x1 equals 0, this is a linear function of x2. And this resembles basically what I'm doing here. So when I drop one of the variables, I can still see this linear regression in both directions. But the good thing is that now we can see that this beta 0 with a tilde is like an, an x2 dependent intercept. So we are basically changing the point in which we are crossing. And you can see that here. So here the intercept was very pretty low and here the intercept is pretty high. And the same with the slope. So we have different slope for different values of x2. And these are, are captured by these lines here that you can see that are steeper and steeper. So let me show you the dangers of missing the interaction with a very simple example. So let's manufacture the data. So I'm going to create two normal distributed random numbers, x1 and x2, and I'm going to create this line. So y is going to be 10 plus, this is the intercept, plus these linear additivity terms and then this interaction. And you can see that this uh, coefficient is pretty large. And then add some noise and it's going to be 0.2. Okay, so let's create a data set and let a look, take a look at the data. These two are completely unrelated, that's why this is because these, these are two random numbers. And you can see that there are some, a couple of interesting things. First of all, you can see that there is a really a linear regression 2 by 2. So basically y depends clearly on x2 and y depends clearly on x1. But this is something weird here. You can see that the variance is increasing. So going back to the first video, this is breaking one of the assumptions, which is the homoelasticity. And why is that? The reason is that be, be, 
besides the fact that these two are uncorrelated, you can see that somehow these are projections of this three-dimensional curve. So this surface is projected in two directions, and this is why we have this increasing variability in those variables. So this is a kind of signature of interaction. So let's take our data and let's do uh, the first initial model. It would be a very simple linear regression without the interaction. So this is the formula, and you can see that R square and adjusted R square are pretty large. So 90% of the variance is explained by these additivity terms, but it's something weird here. And the, the thing is that despite the fact that these are significant, you can see that these coefficients are not captured by, by the regression. So basically the coefficients are wrong. So instead of having 10, 2 and 3, we have something which is a compromise because we don't we are not capturing this interaction here. So this is one of the dangers of, of not including interaction. But we we cannot do we cannot know this in real data because we don't have the exact function there. So let's take a look at, at some controls. So if we plot the residuals versus the fitted data, you can see that there's something wrong here. So clearly this model is not capturing the variability, it's cap not, not capturing the residuals there. Okay, so this is completely wrong. Another thing that you can take into account is that because of the, we are missing this interaction, you can see that the residual standard error is pretty high. So it's more than twice the, the, the noise that we have introduced in, in this mock data. Of course, we cannot know this because we never know the real function, but this is just something that you have to take into account. What if we introduce interaction? There is a very simple way to do that. In R, if you include this multiplication, this doesn't mean just the multiplication of the two of them. The, the, the simple multiplication is the, uh, written in R with this colon, but here the multiplication means S1, X2, and this combined term. Okay, and now good things is that we have better performance. Of course, we are closer to the real function. We are still have some significant uh, coefficients there. We are capturing the coefficients. You can see that this uh, 10, 2, 2, 5 is more or less the one that we are predictor, and the residuals are almost flat, meaning that this model is pretty good, okay? And again, the model is so good that the residual standard error is basically comparable to the noise that we have included for the mock data. So probably you're thinking, okay, but that's kind of cheating because you know what's a real function, but in reality we don't know that. So of course we can use cross-validation. So if we take the carrot function train and we include this train control, which is tenfold cross-validation, you can see that the root mean square error varies a lot, so there is a huge variability for different faults, and there's also quite large variability in R square. And what if we do this thing with interaction? You can see that now the root mean square error doesn't change that much, and actually the error is decreased. So comparing these two models, we are improving a lot. And also the same with R square. So R square is increased, but also the good news is that the, the variability in R square is also decreased. So as usual, cross-validation comes to rescue in order to help us to decide which model is better.